Hey guys, it's the Metal Blade 5, and welcome back to another Metal Blade Fury. So, um, addressing the elephant in the room, since I know you're all thinking it, I'm talking about Persona 5 for the 500th time over the past 9 months. Grand, this video is about the entire Persona series, but that includes 5. I never intended to talk about the game that much, but that's how everything worked out. When you deeply fall in love with a game due to its gameplay, plots, characters, and music to the point that you play for over 160 hours across two playthroughs, combine that with the gameplay being addicting, and it's kind of hard to get out of your head. I like to talk about games I love, which is why I wanted to find some excuse to dedicate a video to Persona 5 in relation to my countdown, but then there was just other stuff I wanted to talk about, and sometimes I couldn't help myself whenever it was an appropriate example, or when reference opportunities fall right into my lap. REVEAL YOUR TRUE SELVES! I'll reveal your true form. I've never received a common complaint about how often I bring up Persona 5, but I can imagine that a lot of people groan when I do now. I've mentioned it so much that it's no longer a last surprise. It's a first expectation. So before I get into this theory itself, I want to make a promise that after this video, you won't ever hear me talk about Persona 5 again. For a while. There is another voice actors and other roles video that I want to do for a game that features quite a few Persona 5 voice actors, which wasn't intentional, but I can put that off for now. And due to the spin-offs, it's going to be uncertain on whether I'll have something else I want to talk about or not. There is a video I want to make in the near future that has a tiny bit to do with Persona, but that's related to one of the other Persona games. Lastly, I should mention that this video contains MAJOR SPOILERS for Personas 3, 4, and 5, so don't watch if you haven't finished them. Now getting into the theory itself, across the Persona series, the main staple is the Velvet Room, which I thought sounded like something from Fifty Shades of Grey when I first heard the name. And within this room is a creepy old man named Igor and his various assistants. Persona players get the basic gist of the Velvet Room. This place exists between dream and reality, mind and matter, yada yada yada. But an important part of the Velvet Room, and the foundations of this theory, is the requirements Igor mentions to enter the room. In all the games, with the exception of both versions of Persona 2, Igor specifically states that only people who are bound by a contract are able to enter the Velvet Room. Only those who have signed the contract can enter this place. It is a room that only those who are bound by a contract may enter. It is a room that only those who are bound by a contract may enter. So you're probably wondering why I'm making a fee about this. I mean, he already tells you how to enter, what more is there to cover? Let me explain. Five throws a spanner in the works, however, as all the party members' personas mention forming a contract with them during their awakenings. Well, in Ryuji's case, they say a pact, but same difference. And even though you don't see Haru's initial awakening, she does say that she formed a contract with her persona. And it's safe to assume that the same applies to Morgana and Akechi. When looking at Igor's wording when mentioning the contract requirement, he says that people who are bound by a contract may enter, which is very ambiguous and thus sounds like he's referring to anyone bound by a contract. However, as it seems very unlikely that someone under a business contract could enter the Velvet Room, so we'll just assume that he's referring to a spiritually based contract like those with a persona. This is important because in 3, 4, and 5, the rest of the party can't even see the Velvet Room, let alone go inside. While the other Phantom Thieves end up inside the Velvet Room near the end of 5, it is stated that this is because of Joker sharing his conviction with them, rather than because of their own contracts. The only time Igor refers to a single contract is in Persona 3, but as all the Persona games take place in the same universe, I doubt that the Velvet Room requirements would just randomly change. It seems more likely to me that the ambiguous version always applies and that in Free's case, Eagle was just talking about a specific contract under that context. So as 5 has shown that there are people bound by contracts who still can't enter the Velvet Room normally, there must be something else related to accessing the Velvet Room. Based on evidence found across the Persona series and the mechanics of the Velvet Room, I believe that this contract Eagle always refers to is actually in relation to the wildcard ability or just the ability to wield multiple personas, since I believe the term wildcard wasn't coined until free. This idea first came to me when thinking about what functions the Velvet Room provides. The ability to fuse personas together to make stronger ones, regaining personas through the compendium, 
and in Five's case, also sacrificing personas to strengthen others, or become items and imprisoning them to learn new skills. These are all features that only someone who can have multiple personas can benefit from. If a character who can only have one persona, like the rest of the party, entered the Velvet Room, then they wouldn't have another persona to fuse with, they wouldn't be able to use the Compendium, and if they were to sacrifice or imprison their persona, they'd no longer have one. It feels like too much of a coincidence that the only characters that can normally enter the Velvet Room possess the ability to have more than one persona when the room's functions are only usable to those people. What further reinforces this idea is one major difference between Persona 1 and the 2 duology compared to the rest of the series. In those games, all of the party members entered the Velvet Room alongside the protagonist. I didn't know about this at first, and thus it almost messed up this entire theory, but then I discovered another major difference between 1 and 2 compared to the others. In 1 and 2, every party member can have two personas. While they can't have as many as the later protagonists, they are still able to wield multiple personas and obtain others from their initial personas. So the requirements of needing to wield multiple personas to access the Velvet Room still applies here. What supports this even further is Persona Q, and while Q is a crossover, Atlas has stated that it is canon. Q features all the party members from 3 and 4, who, again, aside from their protagonist, can only wield one persona. However, in Q, the wildcard ability is distorted due to the crossing between time and space, making both the Persona 3 protagonist, or Makoto Yuki if you're going by his official name, and Yu Narukami only able to wield two personas, their main persona and a Persona. And in turn, this is passed on to all the other Persona users, meaning they can also wield two Personas, just in a different manner. And what's also different about the other members of C's and the investigation team in Q? They can enter the Velvet Room as well! Seems a little odd that when they can only have one Persona, they can't enter the Velvet Room, but when they can have two, they suddenly can, when apparently there's no correlation. However, when making this theory, I noticed a problem. There are two characters in the series that calls this idea into question. However, I have explanations for this based on evidence. The first character is Teddy. In Persona 4, after Nanako's supposed death, Teddy disappears and ends up inside the Velvet Room. But in this case, Teddy only has one persona, so how did he get there? Now, between the two characters, this one's more spitballing, since the game itself doesn't even explain how Teddy got to the Velvet Room, so you could possibly say it's bad writing. The possible reason why Teddy was able to reach the Velvet Room is related to the revelation made in this scene. Teddy is a shadow. According to the Megami Tensei wiki, shadows and personas are very similar. Just that personas are trained, and yes, I know it's a wiki, but from my experience, wikis based on a specific series that are managed by fans of that series are very active in ensuring that the information is accurate. Five even adds to this concept further by making obtainable personas the true forms of the shadows. Four even has the investigation team's shadows turn into their personas upon accepting that side of them. The same happens with Futaba and Five. Personas have been shown to physically appear in in the Velvet Room, even when they're not yet owned by the respective protagonist. So with shadows and personas being very similar, maybe Teddy being a shadow allowed him to bypass the normal Velvet Room requirements. The other character is Akechi. Akechi has two personas, Robin Hood and Loki. Yet as far as we're aware, he can't enter or see the Velvet Room. So this would appear to go against the theory. But while Akechi does have multiple personas, his powers work differently to other wildcard and multiple persona users, which could explain why his situation differs. For one, Robin Hood and Loki are the only personas he is shown to have. He doesn't appear to have the ability to gain more personas through things like fusion, meaning that Akechi's powers are more akin to an average persona user's powers being split into two rather than an outright wildcard ability. Because even the Persona 1 and 2 characters, plus the characters in queue with sub-personas, can gain new ones despite being limited to 2, while Akechi appears to be stuck with what he has. Additionally, data miners have found that Loki is, ironically, part of the Justice Arcana, like Robin Hood, which differs from the wild card as that allows its users to access personas of any Arcana, while Akechi appears to be limited to Justice. As such, Akechi could also be unable to access the Velvet Room due to his powers not exactly being the wild card. There's also one other thing to consider. 
The only time we could have potentially seen Akechi at least noticing the Velvet Room is when he's working alongside the Phantom Thieves. And during that period, Akechi was trying to deceive them. So if Akechi could see the Velvet Room, it's entirely possible that he pretended not to notice it so he wouldn't give away the act. Also, there is the optional boss battles against the assistants in 3, 4, and 5 where they bring the rest of the party into the Velvet Room for the fight. However, these fights can only be done in New Game Plus, which throws their canonicity into question. Although this could also be explained by the assistant forcing the party into the room, which could bypass their requirements. Additionally, in Persona 4 the animation, which arguably is the canon set of events for the original game as it's the origin of Yu's name, Yu fights Margaret by himself, while the rest of the investigation team is absent. But even with the possible conundrums revolving around Teddy and Akechi, the basic idea of my theory is pretty much confirmed by Persona 3 FES during the Answer epilogue. At the end of Persona 3, the protagonist dies and gives his wildcard ability to Aegis. Then in The Answer, Aegis is the main character, and then she can enter the Velvet Room. In fact, Igor specifically says this. Yes, in awakening to the power of the wild card, you are now bound to a contract. Igor says that the wild card and the contract are directly tied to one another. As in the wild card is pretty much the contract that he is referring to every time he brings it up. Don't believe me? The answer actually provides even more evidence for this at the end, where similar to 5, the rest of the party end up in the Velvet Room, where Igor says this. It seems the power of the wild card within you has influenced them as well. And that is the explanation as to why the party could enter. It is directly tied to the wild card. In fact, the whole influencing thing is not that far off from the wildcard distortion in Q, and could even be what 5 refers to as the shared conviction between Joker and the rest of the Phantom Thieves. So there you have it. I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet, but out of all the theories I've done, this one I feel like is the most likely to be true in the end. Since there's so much evidence that ties the Velvet Room and in turn the entry requirements to the wildcard slash ability to wield multiple personas, since the case with 1 and 2 is a bit weird. What with the way the Velvet Room functions, the matching cases of characters having multiple personas and being able to enter the room, the possible explanations for Teddy and Akechi, and especially Igor's dialogue during the answer. Though, regardless of all the evidence, at the end of the day, unless Atlas outright confirms this, it's still just a theory and not fact.